Welcome to Chemistry at York. This video lecture is an open educational resource produced by a collaboration between the Department of Chemistry at York College and the Department of Natural Sciences at LaGuardia Community College of the City University of New York. This lecture is, atom is entitled Atomic Theory Number 5, Molecules and Compounds. My name is Emmanuel Chang, and today we're going to learn some chemistry. Hi, my name is Kelly. I like to cook and martial arts. Hi, my name is Vimal, and I like video games. Hi, my name is Tessa, and I like carbon reaction. Hi, my name is Simon. I like rock music. Um, hi, my name is Dayala Ibrahim. I like working out and also playing sports. Today, uh, in this lecture, we're going to consider what happens when two or more atoms come together. Chemical bonds are the result of attractive forces that join two atoms together. Molecules result when two or more atoms are joined together via chemical bonds. Compounds are formed when two or more elements are chemically bonded together. And sometimes elements can also exist as molecules. This may seem a little bit uh, confusing at first, but I believe the examples that we're going to see in the rest of this lecture will help explain the relationship between bonds and molecules and compounds and elements. There are two types of chemical bonds. Remember, chemical bonds arise from the attractive forces that hold atoms together. The first of the, uh, these two types is ionic bonds. Ionic bonds arise when electrons are transferred from one atom to another. Remember, we learned in an earlier lecture that ions are formed when an atom either gains electrons or loses electrons. When an atom gains electrons, the negative charge increases and you get a negatively charged anion. When an atom loses electrons, it becomes a positively charged cation. When a cation positively charged and anion negatively charged are close together in space, those opposing charges are attracted to each other by electrostatic forces and ionic bonds can form. The second major type of chemical bonds are covalent bonds. And covalent bonds form when electrons are shared between two atoms. Rather than a transferring of electrons from one atom to another, there's a sharing of electrons between two atoms. Covalent bonds are formed when these electrons that occur in one or more pairs are shared in between two atomic nuclei. Elements can exist as individual atoms or as molecules. Many elements, their primary form or their only form is individual discrete atoms. Several uh, elements also exist as molecules, diatomic molecules or polyatomic molecules. At room temperature and atmospheric pressure, these seven elements exist as diatomic molecules. Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Others exist as polyatomic molecules. For example, for example, phosphorus has a common form P4, and sulfur has a common form S8. So even though these are molecules, they are still 
element, elemental molecules. They are individual elements, not compounds. Compounds come into play when we have more than one element. There are two kinds of compounds that we're going to look at, ionic compounds and molecular compounds. So ionic compounds are formed when two elements are joined by ionic bonds. We usually say ionic bonds are formed by the transfer of electrons. Perhaps more precisely, an ionic bond is the attraction between um, cation and anion, or two ions of opposite charges. Cations are positively charged ions are formed from metals, and anions are negatively charged ions are formed from nonmetals. And so in these examples like sodium chloride, calcium chloride, and iron oxide, we can see metal and a nonmetal joined by ionic bonds. The other class of compounds are called molecular compounds, and molecular compounds are formed by covalent bonds, or the sharing of electrons. Examples like water, ammonia, and glucose show us that molecular compounds are formed only uh, be, <clears throat> by nonmetals. So hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, they're all. Now I just use this word formula. A chemical formula is a way of representing a compound. And there are many different types of chemical formulas. We can talk about a molecular formula. A molecular formula is a representation of a molecule that shows the number and types of atoms present. Those are the formulas that we've looked at on the previous slide. Things like H2O, C6H12O6, CaCl2. In CaCl2, you have Ca, which represents calcium, one unit of calcium, and Cl2, which represents chlorine, two units of chlorine. There are also structural, structural formulas. Structural formulas are models that show not only the number and types of atoms, but also how those atoms are connected. There's more information in a structural formula than a molecular formula. It's also more complex. So CH4 over here would be a molecular formula. This image over here represents a structural formula, a simple structural formula called a Lewis structure. There are also other types of structural formulas. For example, here you have what's called a ball and stick model. And the ball and stick model shows the connectivity, like the structural formula does, but it also shows you some mm, three-dimensional information as well, the shape of the molecule in space. And over here you have a space-filling model. The space-filling model shows you not just the three-dimensional uh, configuration of the atoms, but also gives you an indication of the relative size and volume of the atoms in the compound. Here's some other um, chemical formulas or types of chemical formulas. Here you have, again, a molecular formula that shows the number and type of atoms. Here's a condensed formula that gives you a hint at connectivity. So once you get a little more familiar with uh, with how chemicals are put together, you might notice that you have a CH3 and you have a COOH. This, the CH3 is connected to the COOH. This is somewhat better shown in the structural formula where you have here CHHH CH3 and COOH. You can actually see the bonds. The advantage to the condensed formula is that you can type it. You can write it very easily. Whereas the structural formula requires some specialized for software to put together.
And again, here we see a ball and stick model. We see a space filling model. Another concept um, that we can use, that we can apply to formulas is called the empirical formula. The empirical formula gives you the simplest whole number ratio of atoms. For example, the molecular formula tells us C2H4O2. That reflects the structural formula. There, in the molecule, there are actually two Cs, one, two, three, four Hs, and one, two Os. However, certain types of experiments don't show you the connectivity. They only t give you the relative amounts of each element, in which case you don't get C2H402. You get one unit of C, two units of H, and one unit of O. So the empirical formula simplifies the ratio of the subscripts here. C2H4O2 simplifies to C1, H2, and O1. Now we're going to try to clarify um, the difficulty that some students have initially when they look at atoms and molecules. In this image, each sphere represents a hydrogen atom. On the left here, you see elemental hydrogen as atoms, individual atoms. Over here on the right, you see elemental hydrogen, but now they are H2 molecules. Now at room, room temperature and atmospheric pressure, H2 molecules are the common form of hydrogen, but hydrogen at very high energies can also exist as individual atoms. So if we were looking over here at one hydrogen atom, the symbol, we could write it as H, there's simply one atom, and it doesn't exist in the molecular form. That's simple enough, that's clear enough. What students sometimes have the problem with is the difference between this, two hydrogen atoms, and this, one hydrogen molecule that contains two atoms that are bonded together. Two individual atoms with no bond, two atoms that form one molecule. So two hydrogen atoms unbound, we could write as 2H, there are two atoms, still not a molecule. Whereas in the hydrogen molecule, the H2 molecule, we write that H subscript 2, two atoms, but one molecule. When we have two hydrogen molecules, that's another point of difference between the, <coughs> this and this, right? Two hydrogen atoms, two H, two hydrogen molecules, two H2, four atoms, and a total of two molecules. Sometimes you have molecules that have the same chemical formula, the same molecular formula, but different structures, different structural formulas, and therefore different chemical properties. For example, acetic acid and methylformate both have the molecular formula C2H4O2, right? C2H4O2, but they have different structures, very different structures and very different properties. Acetic acid is something you can eat um, if it's dilute enough. Tastes quite good in some instances. C2H4O2, acetic acid, has a condensed formula CH3COOH and the structural formula that we saw a couple of slides ago. Methylformate, on the other hand, is used as an insecticide, not something that you would really want to eat, and has the condensed formula HCOOCH3. Now this is a little bit hard to understand until you've taken a course called organic chemistry. But for now, we can unfold it into this structure. If we just follow along H, H, 
CO. CO. O CH3. O CH3. And so even though acetic acid and methyl formate have the same molecular formula, they have very different structures and very different properties. Now, sometimes you'll have a chemical entity that looks something like a molecular compound. It's held together by covalent bonds. But the whole unit, instead of being electrically neutral, like a molecule or a molecular compound, that whole unit has a charge on it. That unit then is known as a polyatomic ion, an ion made up of many atoms. For example, a common polyatomic ion is NH4 plus ammonium. The plus is not on the H necessarily. The plus over here indicates that the entire unit, NH4, has a single plus charge. And likewise, over here we have phosphate, PO4, 3 minus. Mm. Phosphate is a common ion mm, in our bodies, um, in foods, in lots of things around us. The phosphate has one phosphorus atom and four oxygen atoms, all covalently bond, bound together, and three negative charges distributed somewhere, somehow, over the whole ion. Polyatomic ions function as a unit. And so, once we think about polyatomic ions, then we need to rethink our definition of ionic compounds. Because ionic compounds are compounds formed by ionic bonds, and so far we said ionic bonds are the result of transfer of electrons, but we can also say that polyatomic ions can participate in ionic bonds. So you could have, for example, K2SO4. Here you have potassium, a monatomic cation that's bound with a sulfate, a polyatomic anion. Or you could have something like ammonium phosphate, where the polyatomic cation ammonium is bound to the polyatomic anion phosphate. In other words, an ionic compound now is any compound formed from a cation and an anion. Okay, so let's, um, let's look at a few examples. Um, FeCl3. Iron 3 chloride. <laughs> ionic or molecular? Ionic. Ionic. Yes, ionic yeah. Why is it ionic? Uh, Kelly, why is it ionic? Uh, Fe is a metal, whereas Cl is a non-metal. So when we have a metal with a non-metal, it makes an ionic bond. Good. So let's try this one. Cf4. Molecular. molecular. Who, thinks I, 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 who thinks it's molecular? Who thinks it's ionic? Okay, why do you think it's ionic? Okay, who I else thought it was ionic? Yes, why? I, I think carbon is a metal. Mm. Okay, so what do you think, Tessa? I think it's molecular because carbon and fluorine are both found on the, on, on the periodic table. They're both found in the non-metal section. Mm. So they're both non-metals. So. Right, so non-metal, non-metal. So CF4 is going to be molecular. And let's try ICL3. What's, it, what's that going to be? I think that's going to be molecular. Molecular. And how come? Uh, because I is a non-metal and chlorine is also a non-metal. 
and they're both on the right side of the periodic table. All right, very good. represents non-metals. Okay, so we're okay with this? Yes. Yeah. All right, let's try a few more. Uh, the next one is going to be interesting. So let's try NH4CN. Ah, yeah, so this is a, this is good, because <clears throat> sometimes people get this wrong, because metal or non-metal? Non-metal. Metal or non-metal? Non-metal. Metal or non-metal? Non-metal. Non 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 right, if they're all non-metals, oh, so okay. non-metals should be molecular, right? Yeah. Except what you need to recognize, which you all did, is here's a polyatomic ion, NH4+, and here's another polyatomic ion, C and minus. So when you have two polyatomics, you get <coughs> ionic. So are you saying that when you have a plus charge and a minus charge, it's always ionic? Exactly. So instead of memorizing the element itself for being non-metal or metal? Yeah, so whenever you have a cation and an anion, you get an ionic. Uh, okay. Okay, <laughs> okay and let's try one more. NH3. Molecular? Molecular. Yeah, so that one is molecular. That's right. And why is it molecular? Two non-metals. Two non-metals, right. NH3. Non-metal, non-metal. Great. So to review what we covered in this lecture, first, we covered chemical bonds, ionic and covalent bonds. We covered some information about elements and compounds and how they relate to molecules and atoms. We looked at different types of chemical formulas and we learned about polyatomic ions. We hope you enjoyed this video and thank you all for watching.